there waiting and everything everybody just dies down what in the world is wrong with you guys like awakeness is like oh well and I know what they thought what what's going on what are they doing all right you can be seated this morning praise the Lord we all need a little bit of comic relief every now and then uh, like I said Mary Hart does good like a medicine and prayerfully you've had a double dose of medicine already uh, that was the funniest sound I've ever heard with a that was hilarious uh, I kind of wish we'd have got that on tape. Speaking of things on tape and on film, um, there is a picture on Facebook of my venture into a very small uh, restroom facility in Columbia, South America. The doorway is about that tall. And uh, if you're on Facebook, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, that was hilarious. I really thought, I was like, I can't be that bad. Oh, boy. I come around the corner and it was underneath a stairwell and I just looked at it and I went well I done put my foot in my mouth I got to get in there so I shoved myself into this little space it was uh, very uh, quaint and um, we appreciate your, your prayers and your thoughts this last week we're glad to be home uh, the Lord um, used many different aspects of our trip um, Ashley Pettit and Michelle Krieg, they both uh, work diligently every day outside building and working uh, on a kitchen area. And uh, not only did they do a work that blessed the students, but they did not have an idea or the fullness of an idea how their life was ministering to a couple of people that were actually had given up on ministry and uh, felt like they were kind of forced into coming, but they meshed together and through their lives, encouraging those two uh, lives. Um, you know, I got a text message yesterday from one of them. They're stirred back up about getting involved back in their church and back in ministry and laying aside the things that hurt them. And uh, so I'm grateful for that. So, you know, a lot of times you really don't understand the fullness of your impact on the earth. We just kind of uh, float through life and think that we don't have an impact, but we really have an impact on people's lives. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, we were able to um, play with the little kids at the orphanage, and that was uh, very interesting. They learned how to play kickball, and kickball for them, uh, you, you guys know I'm competitive, and so I didn't want to let them win. You got little kids like, I'm like, let's crush them. But no, no, everybody had to not catch the ball when they kicked them. I'm like, really? Come on. No. So, but, uh, you know, we played with them, let them win, and it was a great time uh, just watching. One little boy didn't want to kick the ball. He wanted to kick me the whole time. So, I, I, I kid you not, he is running behind me, and he's so fast, and I'm not, and he's running every time, wham! And I'm like, you know, I think they planted him out there to distract me so I wouldn't get people out at first base, but, and I probably shouldn't have been playing anyway. But anyway, so he's sitting there kicking me, and every time he'd do it, I'd turn around and grab him, take him to the ground and tickle him and uh, that seemed to be what he wanted so uh, after we we all got wore out and they still had much more energy left uh, we took them back to the orphanage and uh, fed all of them um, pizza and that's something that over there they really don't get a chance to get a lot you can get 20 pizzas here for probably you know 120 130 dollars well, unfortunately, over there, pizza is considered a luxury item, and it's about $250. And, um, but we, we blessed them and uh, got them pizza, and it was just a wonderful thing just seeing them. And, and folks on the team got to share their story with them and love on them. And uh, one little girl has been there now for about three years. And the first time I met her, she was just learning to walk. And... Um, I remember I took her on my shoulders when she was just learning to walk and she would, you know, she was light enough to it didn't hurt me. She would pull my hair as we're walking down the street and she's still there. 
and uh, she's about three years old now, and uh, just a beautiful young lady. All the kids there are precious, and uh, so thank you for your prayers, and not just your prayers, but uh, also your help um, in, in helping us to uh, be able to provide that kind of stuff for those kids. Uh, it was a great blessing, but we're glad to be home, glad to be safe, and uh, all is well. I know uh, there was a lot of information given to you today. Uh, May is going to be a very busy month. I want to encourage you, even if you don't have the money to register for the Visioneering Conference today, if you want to attend, fill the form out. We have to order materials. We have to get everything straight. Um, and yes, it is. Uh, if you were to ever pursue anything at seminary level, uh, at master's level, um, training, uh, it will be something that is um, accredited and offered to you as well uh, through this class. So it's a very, uh, I can tell you now, one class at a master's level is not going to be $70. It's going to be like, more like $1,500 for the class. Um, so, I mean, it's a great opportunity. Um, no, we don't make any money off of it. Matter of fact, um, most of the time we always go in the hole on that kind of an event. Um, so, you know, take advantage of that. Also, as you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 8, uh, I failed to tell the uh, congregation in the early service this, uh, but right before we uh, boarded the plane uh, in Norfolk, I'm sorry, in Atlanta, I got a phone call from the voter registrar's office, and they had gone through all of our paperwork. Uh, so the McCarty for Change campaign is now officially up and running, and I have been certified by the state. Um, I've been certified by the um, uh, state and now officially on the ballot. Uh, we were actually the first one for any of the supervisor positions to get the information in, so we're grateful for that and just believe that God will help us as we navigate forward to help influence change, not only uh, in the, the county at large, but from our total county to our schools to everything. Um, I believe that uh, God has a purpose in it, and I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity. We got our tax ID number, uh, got all the accounts opened up, uh, and so it's a new area for me, so continue to pray, um, but we're continuing to do our best to make a difference uh, in this community, and uh, I believe it'll be something that uh, will not just benefit the community, but all of us uh, as you have a voice. One of the things that we've lost throughout time is godly people lost their voice, and uh, it is our hope to restore such a voice uh, through leadership and partnership and, and being transparent with people. So thank you for your prayers on that. And thank you for your help. Let me just say, um, you know, the first set of uh, petitions, um, some things will happen and they had been taken. And then so many of you rallied together uh, and we obtained in just a few short days well over 200 signatures uh, and I just want to say thank you to everybody that helped. Uh, it was uh, a great thing. We had some people that, uh, you know, I went walking around. They went, I've already signed it. And I said, well, I know. And I had to explain to them. And, and they were gracious enough to, uh, to re-sign it. But uh, I believe God has a plan. And I believe God has a plan for, for you. And I believe God has a plan for us together. Genesis chapter 8 is where we're going this morning. Uh, next week is Mother's Day. Uh, I will tell you that next week you don't want to miss it because uh, there's going to be the debut of a brand new ministry that has been working very hard uh, here at the church, uh, a brand new dance uh, style of ministry, a worship type dance ministry that's been working very hard. Um, it's not been something that, uh, you know, they've widely advertised, hey, come watch us practice or anything like that, but those uh, they've been working, I think, on Tuesday nights. Is that kind of... They've been working on Tuesday nights, and, uh, you know, so I'm grateful for them. And one of the things that, you know, this is my first time preaching on our newly uh, formed stage, and, and, you know, I told them in the first service, you know, you hear a lot of things from people saying, oh, man, the stage is great, to others saying, oh, it looks like we're back in the 1940s. Well, here's the cool thing that, that I kind of think about when I, when, I, when I think of a stage. It's really not an eternal thing, um, and it really doesn't make any eternal difference, so what's the big deal? Uh, and here's the cool thing. This stage is actually going to be able to foster a whole lot of ministry now other than just pulpit. Uh, you're, we're going to have the, the dance team to be able to use it, some uh, future things that, that um, I believe are going to come together uh, in some drama stuff. How many of you guys would like to see some real live short 
type skits, you know, that kind of get you in the, the mode for the message. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And so, you know, we're trying to develop things so that we can kind of embrace all that stuff. So change is not always easy, um, but I wasn't here last week to be able to uh, uh, talk about that. Um, but you know what? Always remember, if it's not eternal, don't get bent out of shape over it. Uh, if it doesn't save someone's soul, then it's really not worth arguing about. Uh, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, Genesis chapter 8 is where we're going to go uh, this morning. Uh, I want you to look at this scripture today like you've never looked at it before. We're going to start in verse 6. I want you to think about it in light, because I'm going to share it in a light that I've never, ever shared scripture before. And I want to talk to you today very briefly about transitional transformation. Let's say those two words. Transitional transformation. How many of you know that our lives are continually changing? Okay. How many of you are... No. No, that's not the right way to word it. How many of you feel older now than you used to feel? You notice I didn't say how many of you are older. How many of you feel older than you are? All right. So uh, how many of you wear different clothing today than you did, oh, a decade ago? I still have a size 72 suit coat that I used to wear. Um, yeah, so stuff, you know, has changed. So I want you to see this scripture in a new light today. Beginning in verse 6, it says, So it came to pass at the end of the 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Next verse. Then he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her, feet, of her foot, and she returned in the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her. One translation says he stretched out himself and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. In verse 11, Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters had receded from the earth. Father, would you add your blessing and anointing to your word today? Help us to see it in a light that perhaps we've not seen it before, but help us to be changed in transition let us be transformed and lord help us to understand that you will always stretch us to fill us i thank you lord for what you're doing in our lives a lot of things that we are embarking on together as a church they're territories that we've never been in before we've never been in a flood before we've never seen the things that we're seeing now lord it's it's different today than it was in the post office it's different today than it was in the Ruritan Club. You have brought us a long way, and while we're grateful for where we've come from, we thank you, Lord, in advance for where you're going to take us if we remain faithful and sensitive to you in all things. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Can you imagine being Noah? Have you ever thought, I mean, really thought about this story? They, 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 they are crammed in this ark. There's a lot of animals. Over 17,600 animals are crammed on this ark. Oh, and guess what? There is no air conditioning system. There is no ventilation system. How I many of you know it probably stunk? There was a whole lot of stinking going on. How, how many of you have children? You've ever walked into their room and the smell of a locker room hits you in the face? I have one who when you open the door, the smell of football seems to never leave the house. But can you imagine being Noah, walking around the ark? You have been jammed in there for 377 days. Oh, my Lord, I would go stir crazy. How many of you would go stir crazy? Sitting there with 17,600 species of animals and you are surrounded by stink. When we were in Colombia, one of the most challenging things 
was the septic system set up. It is quite different than what we have. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. So my wife and I, we went to a store called Exito. I think we went there two, two times, something like that. The first time I told her, I said, listen, when we go in there, please let us get some Febreze. We forgot. Finally, we picked it up the day before we left. Everywhere I walked in that room, I was going, because you're connected to everybody else's. I know that's blunt, and y'all are like, eh. It really does make you appreciate what you do have at home when you go abroad and you see just what others don't have. But anyway... I could only imagine being crammed in this 97,000 square foot, three-story high stink box. And this is where he is. I want to share some things about this story that maybe you've never uh, considered. Not only was he cooped up in there with all those animals, but I believe God was doing something very powerful because earlier in chapter 8, the Bible tells us that the ark, so the waters begin to recede, and the ark comes to rest on the top of Mount Ararat. How many of you have ever heard about that, okay? Mount Ararat. And sometimes they talk about archaeological things and about there. But the Bible says it was the 17th day of the seventh month. And some of you are saying, well, so what? Well, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you thought that. So the significance there is you have to go to Exodus 12, verse 1 through 5 to understand. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. What's happening? Passover, okay? Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. It goes on to tell you that if the lamb's too small, join together with a neighbor, and so on and so forth. So it's setting up Passover. If you go all the way to the New Testament, you understand that Jesus was crucified right before Passover. You remember that? So let's go all the way back. So knowing that Jesus was crucified at the time of Passover, let's go all the way back to Noah's Ark. It's resting on the top of Mount Ararat on the 17th day of the seventh month. The significance there is is that when you look and study uh, Hebrew or Hebraic calendars, the calendar in Hebrew before the time of Exodus, if you merged them and mirrored them together, the seventh month became the first month when the children of Israel were getting ready to leave Egypt. It is the same time period. So I'm telling you that because... Jesus Christ came to save us, did he not? So he lived, he died, he died at Passover, and three days later, according to a Hebraic calendar, he would have risen on the 17th day of the first month of the Hebraic calendar following Passover. Why is that important for Mount Ararat? Because that was the 7th and the 17th, but it was changed when they left Egypt. It's the same time period. So the type here, or the symbolism here is, that just like Christ came to save us, so did God do for Noah's family. That's a powerful realization that God has that type and pattern in the Old Testament at the same time of Passover, that God would have them settling on the top of Mount Ararat that is a power. I would encourage you, feel free to study that. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that the Hebraic calendar are actually, it's the same time frame renamed by God in Exodus. Isn't that fascinating? It's not where I'm going this morning, but I just wanted to give you that because I thought in studying that, I was like, wow, what an amazing thing that God used the same time period that, that there was on Ararat, the same time period of Passover, and then the same time period with Christ. I don't think that's a, a, a coincidence. Do you? I, I don't think it's a guy. I think it has some significance there. And I think the significance is that God will always sustain you and can save you through anything. So let's talk about this guy, this cat named Noah. 
He's on this boat. He's all cramped up. He's probably frustrated. How many of you have ever been around uh, maybe a messy house or a dirty situation and just frustrates you? How many OCD neat freak people do we have? You want to come to my house? No, I'm just joking. It, it, it just makes you get in a bad mood. I can see Noah as he's walking around the ark and maybe, maybe he's having to cover himself with his burlap and he's thinking, my Lord, is this ever going to end? And sometimes when we face struggles in our life, we wonder, is it ever going to end? Here's the thing. He'd never built an ark before because nobody knew what one was. He never knew what a flood was because no one had seen it ever before. So here they are. It's a new storm. It's a new boat. It's a new day. And it's devastatingly different than anything they'd ever experienced before. So what do you do in those moments? What do you do when life becomes devastatingly different for you? How do you respond? Do you get angry? Do you get upset? Do you lash out at other people? Do you take it out on other folks? What do you do when the storm waters rise up in your life? But here's the good news. The Bible says that there came a time that the rain stopped. Look at your neighbor and tell them the rain stopped. Now, we like it, especially in the summertime when you've planned a family picnic and you're going to Bush Gardens or King's Dominion or some other place and it starts to rain. It is a joy when the rain stops and you are able to get outdoors. The Bible says that the rain stopped. Can you look? I, I can imagine Noah was more excited to open a window than anybody had ever opened a window in, in, in the life here on out. How many, how many of you have spring cleaning? You open your windows and you air the house out. Just a few of you, okay? How many of you do window cleaning? Whatever you do, somebody, you're going to open the windows and you're like, dear Lord, let the house air out. So I can imagine Noah, when he figures out that the rain has stopped, it's the first time it's recorded, he opens the window and I can see him maybe spilling his head out the window going, oh boy, oh the air, oh probably what we would do can you imagine being surrounded by methane air <laughs> do the math it's probably very frightening probably like breathing mace fumes that's burning your lungs and he opens the window and he's excited the bible says that he's standing there and he's got the window open the bible tells us that he releases the raven the interesting thing about a raven is uh, ravens are kind of the ADHD birds of the air. They go like that. They run all over the place. You can't, they're just all over the place. The Bible says that that raven went to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. We, we've seen that language somewhere. We've, we've heard it somewhere. And it was when God had an encounter with Satan concerning Job. And Satan said, I have gone to and fro. The Hebrew for to and fro in Genesis is the same Hebraic writing that was Satan's words of he was going to and fro on the earth. I want to submit to you that the raven quite well could represent our flesh. How many of you know our flesh is kind of ADHD? We get upset about this and we get upset about that and we, we crave this and then we don't crave that. We, we like roast beef today, but bless God, we got to have chicken tomorrow. We're just ADHD and the flesh is just crazy. And sometimes we need some, some, some something to calm us down and the raven is an ADHD bird. It's just going to and fro. I can see Noah as he's sitting there and he's watching that bird. It's flapping around and the Bible says it didn't come back. You've got to understand something about your flesh. Your flesh, if you let it lead, will lead you to a place that you might not come back. I mean, that's just, that's just the, the blunt, honest truth. This flesh will get you in trouble. You know, well, I'm going to try drugs. Maybe my parents won't see it. I, I'm going to try this, and maybe, maybe my spouse won't see it. I, I'm going to try this, and... Sin, listen, I heard it when I was a young man. I thought, wow, what a cliche statement, but nonetheless true. Sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. Have you ever heard something similar to that? 
Okay? What's true? And here he is in the middle of a nightmare cruise. Have you ever been on a cruise? No? Some of you? Okay. So this is a nightmare cruise. 377 days in a cruise to nowhere with water that you've never seen before. And you're frustrated. How many times does life happen? And we feel like we're on the cruise to nowhere and the flesh just gets out of the window and it's just going all over the place. Do you know once you let the flesh out, it's hard to get it under control. The Bible says that he waits a little while and then he goes back in and the Bible says he releases the dove. Here's what I love about the dove. Remember I told you earlier I was just drawing a a kind of a, a, a trace on the salvific or salvation experience from Mount Ararat to Passover to Christ and how it's all in the same time period in the Hebraic calendar. I think that's important, but I think it's also important that he really releases the dove. The dove goes out and comes back again. But when the dove comes back, it, the Bible tells us it has no place for their feet to land on. Pastor Marcel, would you come help me again? such a precious man so willing to be the illustrative point of contact in a message I heard someone say sucker I don't know who said it but I heard it in the distance Welcome back, Pastor. thank you I don't know if that was sincere or sarcastic I'm not real sure but the Bible says that he Opens a window. I can see him stepping up on a high place to open the window. Yeah, be real careful with that. There you go. We found out in the first service, if you stand on the backside, it might flip you this way. He's standing there, and the Bible says that he stretches out of the window. And when he stretches out of the window, the dove has a place to land. Now, what's interesting is, the first time the dove comes back, it has nothing with it. He waits seven days, comes back in, shuts the window. Methane overwhelms him probably again. And seven days later, he comes back to the window. He comes back with the dove. He opens the window and he lets the dove go. But this time, when the dove goes out, it comes back to him and it lands on a place that has been made ready for the dove to land on because Noah had stretched out. How I many of you know when God stretches you, it does not always feel good? Did you know that? We don't like, I don't want to stretch. Don't make no sense. I never had to stretch before. You know, I, I didn't have to do it before. You know, this way, we, we want to do it that way. Well, I don't know. I don't like to stretch. It don't make me feel good. Right, really? And he just, he stretches out and that dove comes and lands on him and Noah realizes that in the dove's mouth, what's on the dove's mouth? There's an olive branch that is in the mouth of the dove. Now, if you study the Old Testament, you know that the anointing oil that was made in the temple was made from olive oil, crushed olives, and the dove, the dove didn't bring back an oak leaf. It didn't bring back a sassafras leaf. It didn't bring back a, 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 a cassia leaf. It brought back the branch of an olive tree. I think that's significant. So he stretched out, and then all of a sudden, in the midst, look, the waters are high. The difficulty is great. Life has happened, and he didn't plan on it. He didn't like it, but life had happened. But in the midst of it, God was causing him to learn how to stretch. Have you ever stretched your muscles and you can feel them pulling? It's like, oh, ow, ow. And you got to lean a little bit further, kind of like the hamstring. You got to lean a little bit further. And it's tight and it's just, man, it feels like it's going to break. But stretching prepares that muscle for battle. It prepares that muscle to, to, to endure whatever activity. Thank you, sir. Didn't he do a great job? We won't uh, keep him up there any longer. <laughs> Noah had found grace in the eyes of God. God had saved his family. It was a tremendous salvation. 
But then in the middle of life, in the middle of where he was, instead of chasing the flesh, I want you to see the, the, the symbolism and the parallelism that's here. Instead of chasing the flesh, he didn't stay there for days saying, I wonder where the ravens are, I wonder where they are, and get all caught up in one aspect of what was going on. He knew the flesh was just, this flesh gets us into trouble. But what does he do in his learning experience? He stretches, and then on the heels of that stretching, the dove lands in his hand. Can I tell you that we've got to learn to clear the path for God to move in our lives? We've got to learn to clear a path. Sometimes we've got to clear the path of the flesh, clear the path of all this stuff, of our preconceived ideas, because the ravens will get you in trouble. The raven in life, the flesh of this life, will get us in trouble, but God needs to have space in your life that only comes when you stretch out of the window of your time and you say to Him, here's a place for you to land. Here's a place for you to come and dwell. I am here, and I'm, I, even though I'm struggling, I'm right here. Listen, God is a filler. He's not a forcer. God will never force his way in your life. Never. He's a gentleman. He doesn't do that. Say this with me. I must create space for God in my life. Listen. Sometimes you've been, you've been surrounded with methane and you've been surrounded by all the stink of life and the boat's been rocky and everything's been going crazy and you've misinterpreted the, 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 the cow bumped into you over there on that level and you wanted to slaughter the cow but you knew you couldn't just, you know, who knows what Noah went through in that boat. But he came, he came to a time that he had to set all that stuff aside and he opens the window and he stretches forth and he releases the dove. I know some of you say, well, he had to release the dove. You know, we could talk about letting the Holy Spirit release in our life and setting some of us free. We could go from that standpoint, um, but, but that's not where our, that, the, the road I'm taking us on today, but that could very well apply. You've got to create space for God in your life, and he stretches out, and then all of a sudden when that dove comes back on the seventh day, the number seven is very important because it is a number of what? Do you, how many of you have studied numbers in Scripture? What does represent? Okay? It, it's a perfect, it's a completion type number. And, and the Bible says on seven days later, how many of you know God's working in you and sometimes you can't see the result of it? And sometimes you can't see the fruit of it until the process of time goes on and then you look back and go, wow, God was really working in my heart and he was working in my life. And on the heels of that, that dove comes back and he's bearing with himself an olive branch that is saying to Noah, and I believe saying to us, that God sets us up for salvation even though we're going through life and things are crazy. And then in the middle of that, if we will just stretch out to God and look to Him, that He will always send His Spirit upon us that will guide us, that will strengthen us, that will give us peace, but He'll never force Himself. You notice Noah had to stretch out before the dove would land. God doesn't force his way into your life. He doesn't force his way into your marriage, your business. He doesn't do that. And I know that life throws you curveballs. We have children. We have obstacles. We're, we're older today than we were yesterday. There's stuff that happens all the time. I understand that. But when life is throwing you curveballs, are you hunkered down in the midst of craziness? Or do you have your arms stretched out to God saying to God, do whatever you want to do in my life and stretching out to him saying, I know I'm in a new place. I know I'm in a new season. I know I don't understand it all, but I'm stretching out for you and I'm saying to you, do what it is that you want to do in my life and don't let me focus on the raven. The raven gets us in trouble. But God wants to give us life and God wants us to transform our community. But you can't transform unless you've been transformed. You can't bear a message of transformation to other people unless you yourself have been transformed. And if you can just picture him stretching out of that window, if you and I would learn to take that posture with God every day and stretch out and say, God, there is room for you in my life. There's room for you in my marriage. There's room for you in my job. There's room for you everywhere. I stretch out so that you have a place 
to land. But not only do you have a place to land, you have a place to lead me. The olive branch is symbolic of God giving you what you need in his anointing to handle what's ahead for your journey. That's important because stuff happens. Then the Apostle Paul said that we had to crucify the flesh weekly. Isn't that what he said? No, he said daily. Sometimes this flesh just fights with you. How many of you have ever argued with your spouse? How many of you have ever lost that argument? How many, it doesn't matter what I ask you, you're not going to answer me. Thank you. All right. <laughs> you got to surrender to God every day. You got to get up and start your morning. God, whatever you want to do in my life today, you do it. Order my steps with your word. In other words, I'm opening the window of my chaotic life and I'm stretching my arms out and I'm saying to you, here I am if you will just land on me. I know I can make it in the next season of my life. Listen, life is difficult. You've got to open the window of your life. You have to welcome God in. I, I know there's things you don't understand about Him. I know there are things, well, I just don't know. But I'm telling you, He's just as real as the seat you're sitting on. I don't say that because I have to as a pastor. It's something I live. I know. I've seen God take hopeless situations and put them back together. I've seen God deliver people that everybody wrote off in society. I've seen people bound by addiction that God comes in and he ministers to them. Here's why. Because he's real and he wants people to stretch themselves and to avail themselves and say to God, here I am, use me. Or better yet, how about make me usable? Sometimes we ask God to use us and we're not usable. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you have ever eaten dinner at someone else's home? Okay. I won't ask you who when I ask this question. Have you ever sat down at the dinner table and realized that one of the forks didn't get everything off in the dishwasher? But you're start trying to figure out a way not to... Or maybe you look in your glass of iced tea and you see maybe something floating in it that you didn't order. You're in the middle of eating your pasta and you find one piece of pasta that's a little dark and a whole lot smaller and you realize it's from someone's head. Some of you said, time to leave. <laughs> Not the church, but the dinner table wherever that's at. Maybe you sit there and you look at that fork and you say, man, I can't believe, your mind's going, I can't believe they just, they put that fork there. Didn't they see that it wasn't usable? Then all of a sudden, maybe you start, you, listen, God, if you, God will never set you on the table if you're not usable. Here's why. Because the world will not pick up your cup to drink from it. You have to be usable. You have to be washed. You have to live. There's still something to be said about living a holy lifestyle. I know young people don't like to hear it. I'm not talking about beehives and buns and dresses down to the, un and sewing a dress to where you look like a, well anyway, sewing a dress all the way down that it covers your feet and you're hopping through the forest like little bunny foo-foo. I'm not talking about all that, but there's still something to be said about a life that is sold out to God, that stretches its arms out every day and says, God, here I am. Am. If you want to use me, let me be usable. Whatever. If you want to say something through me, then I want to make sure that I'm right on top. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be transparent with you. Running for public office, I, I know I may appear strong and stuff at times, and I like to think I am at times, but the area of the unknown causes the inside of me to shudder. I know that without the leading of the Holy Spirit, I won't be able to do anything. And I think in our lives, when we look at life, or we're getting ready to enter into a new season of life, and our insides get all knotted up. And here's why. Your insides get that way because it's a God-shaped void that has to have God seated right on the middle of it so that you navigate through it properly. 
We've got to have God. We've got to surrender to Him every day and say, God, you've given me your grace to sustain me, but now I'm stretching and saying, give me your Holy Spirit on a daily basis so that I might have the anointing that's necessary to navigate the craziness of this life. See, that'll give you confidence. Not, not, not arrogance, but confidence. But the problem is we've got too many ravens hanging around our lives. Too many things that, you know, we say, well, God, you know, God understands. God doesn't understand half the stuff that we say. He understands. We've got to learn to stop trusting our flesh and start trusting the Spirit of God to guide us. And if God doesn't give you an answer right away, then you hold on until He gives you an answer. Don't ever do anything in haste. Dr. Ottawa sent me a, a message on Facebook. I didn't get it till I got home. Oh, by the way, when I got off the plane, I, I, I just got to give you this. When I got off the plane, I turned my phone on when we got back to the States. And Ashley's here. She'll tell you it sounded like you were in a casino. My phone went crazy. But the ding, ding, the ding, 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 ka ching, ka ching, ka ding, 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 ding. Between emails, voice messages, and text, I had over 1,100 of them. So if one of those is yours and I haven't gotten back to you, please just be patient, okay? Because 1,100 is a whole lot, okay? And if you called my voicemail when it was full, it's because there was 54 voice messages with an average of two and a half minutes apiece. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot, you know, crammed on there. So, you know, it, sometimes it, you, your life is just dinging. Da ding, ding, da ding, ding, da ding, ding, da ding. What do you do first? What do you do? Sometimes you just got to stop and stretch out to God and say, what are you doing in my life? What do you want to do in my life? And you got to calm your soul. Listen, this is going a whole different route than the first service. I can tell you that now. Sometimes you've got to open the window of the chaos in your life and you've got to get your soul calmed down and, and stop. Listen, like I said, if, it doesn't, if it's not an eternity issue, then why get burnt up over it? It doesn't make any sense. It's amazing. If we had the spiritual fortitude to identify the enemy like we do, like, like the stuff we get upset over, my goodness. It distracts us. Enemy knows what he's doing. He really does. He does. And there are moments that I've got to throw up the window of my life and I've got to stretch my hands out and I've got to say, I've got to just calm my spirit before you, Lord. I just Because you don't read anyone else being with him in that moment. You don't read of any of his children yanking on his coat saying, Daddy! You know, he's by himself here. There he is. Sometimes you've got to get away by yourself and you've got to stretch out your spiritual arms and you've got to say to God, help. I've never been here before. I've never traveled this way before. I don't understand where I'm at. I don't understand all these different kinds of things. And here's what happens. The dove, the Holy Spirit, will always come to the children of God who wait on the Lord because the Bible says those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And he comes bearing an olive branch. He comes bearing an anointing that will help you to navigate through this life even though it's crazy. But you've got to make space for him. Noah had to make space. We don't hear, how'd they get down the mountain? By God's grace. God sustained them in a boat they'd never made before in a storm that they'd never seen before. The Bible not only says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but it says the caverns of the deep burst open. They'd never seen that before. And some of you are going through things in your life that you've never seen before. You don't need another book. You don't need another self-help series. What you need is to stretch out your arms to God and say, here I am. I don't understand A, B, and C, but you know what? A, B, and C really don't have any eternal value. So here I am stretching myself out before you and I'm saying to you, God, lead me. Guide me. I believe that in, when Noah, and I'll close with this, I believe that Noah, when he saw that olive branch in the mouth of the dove, I can see him going, oh, there is hope. 
there's hope because that olive branch for him and his family represented hope. Let me say, well, how do you see that? Um, because up until this time, the only thing they got to see was water. It was the longest cruise to nowhere for 377 days. 92 plus thousand feet of animal mess, three stories high. That's what our life feels like sometimes. Husbands and wives, doesn't it feel like that when you're fussing with each other? I'm just being honest. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't know any other way to be. That's just super transparent. When, when you're in the midst of, when you've locked horns with your spouse over an issue, it just, man, it feels like you're in an ark and it's 92,000 square feet. It's three stories high and every animal has rained on your parade. And you're struggling to breathe. But if you'll just push open the window and stretch out your arms, Say, God, here I am. I don't have all the answers, but here I am. I don't even have to understand everything. Notice Noah ever said, God, could you please tell me how the fountains of the deep broke open? Would you please show me the map of that? Would you please? He didn't ask any of that. When that dove came bearing that olive branch, he did, took a deep breath, I believe. And I believe in his heart and mind, he would say, Yahweh's made a way where there seems to be no way. I think some of you need to hear that today, that God is still able to make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. Yes, he will make a way for me. He goes before you like the dove being released the first time. He brings back to you what you need for hope in your moment. And He guides you the rest of your life. But you have to, you got to stretch out. You got to prepare a place for the dove to land. What would have happened if Noah would have shut the window and gone back inside? The dove would have never landed. And he would have missed a significant moment in his own life. Would you stand with me? Here's what we're going to do in closing. And, and I know it might seem a little bit weird and you'll be like, eh, I don't want to do that. So it's cool, I understand. And just, I mean, I've got all of you looking at me and you've only got one of me looking back at you. So think about the pressure up here. Would you just take your hands and just stretch them out? Stretch them out. And Lord, we want to say to you while our arms are stretched out, I know it might feel funny, but we're saying to you, here we are in the midst of a flood, in the midst of moments that we don't understand, and we're asking you, would you land on us? Would you give to us the anointing to navigate the rest of our life would you give us wisdom in all things? Would you allow us, God, not to get concerned and caught up with the things that are not eternal? Help us not to get distracted by the things that are not eternal. Lord, I know we have to have vehicles and homes, but often the cares of those things often sidetrack us, but they're not eternal. Help us, I pray, to open the window of our chaotic life Maybe it feels like we've been on a 377 cruise, a day cruise to nowhere and there's craziness, but help us to open the window and get hope one more time. Help us to make room for you every day. Help us to crucify our flesh every day. And help us to work diligently to keep the ravens out. And help us to always focus on the dove which is your spirit guiding us into and through the seasons of our life, our lives. Lord, you've called us to wonderful things here at Healing Waters. We've been on a journey for a long time. 
But what you do in us today is different than what you did in the post office. And it's different than what you did in the Ruritan Club. And 10 years from now, it's going to be different then, should you tarry, than it is now. So, Lord, help us to open the window. Stretch ourselves out and say, Do a work in us, O oh Lord, through your spirit that we cannot do ourselves. And help us to walk this very thing out for your glory. I pray strength to those that need it the most today. I pray that they would have a moment to catch their breath today for those that need it. Guide them through the rest of their life. That you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Look at me for a moment. I know that might have been awkward, and some of you are probably like, well, I didn't put my deodorant on, and I just didn't want to throw my arms up like that. Who cares about all that stuff? But you know what? Thank you for those of you that did it. Here's the thing. While we were praying, I, I just want, I opened my eyes, I looked out, and I seen all these arms up. Listen, that's our spiritual posture. I'm not saying, look, you, I know you can't drive your car with both hands extended through both sides of the window and you're driving with your knee. I know some of the ladies like to think they can do it as they eat a biscuit, and put on their makeup and talk on the cell phone. I know, but, you know, but learn this posture, stay in that posture. And the last thought to leave this place with today is focus on the dove. Don't get caught up on the ravens. The flesh will trick you. Your emotions will trick you. Oh yeah. Oh yes, they will. But don't lean to your own understanding. But in all your ways acknowledge him. And the Bible says, and he will what? Direct your path. In other words, he'll send the dove with an olive branch. He'll give you direction. He'll give you his presence as a covering. And you'll survive and you'll make it. So as we get ready to leave this place today, men, I know you, we've got a, a special time together. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to find two or three people that you didn't maybe greet with earlier. And I want you to look them straight in the eyes and I want you to tell them, hey, focus on the dove. And let's remind ourselves that no matter how deep the waters, no matter how great the stink that's covering our lives or around us, okay, I know that's comical sounding. Focus on the dove. Open the window. Focus on the dove. And God will lead you to whatever it is you're facing. We love you. This coming Wednesday night, we're starting a brand new series. I encourage you to be a part of it. It's called Gambling with God. You say, what? You just have to come out and see. Have a wonderful day, and don't lose sight of the dove. God bless you.